The process of decarbonization of our societies has already started. It represents our evolution towards a production system that does not alter the equilibrium of the carbon cycle. We already see the implications of emissions poured into the atmosphere between the Industrial Revolution and today. And these changes will be with us for a long time. Evidence tells us we have already caused enough damage with our past actions that it is now time to break the cycle. While most of past emissions came from developed countries, most of future emissions will be coming from developing countries for economic and demographic reasons. But in the same countries, we also start to see unprecedented strides for change. So what will this revolution bring and what are the opportunities it entails? If we want to limit climate damages and fulfill the Paris Agreement goal to keep average temperature below 2 degrees Celsius, the general idea is that net CO2 emissions will have to go to zero in 2060-2070. This is why several countries and regions have made statements about mid-century that imply carbon neutrality or even climate neutrality. But are we confident about the feasibility of bringing emissions to zero? Our global economy emits today around 50 billion tons each year. This is more than 40% higher than what we emitted in 1990. To make it even more complicated, all these emissions are not coming from one activity alone, as in the case of CFC gases, which were damaging the ozone layer of the poles. They come instead from many different activities and sectors, from coal power plant to intensive farming. Net zero emissions means that we will have to change the way we produce and use energy for the most part. However, we will need to bring emissions to zero everywhere, where it is too costly or simply too complex to bring emissions to zero, both in terms of sectors and activities or in terms of regions, we will have to compensate by taking emissions away from the atmosphere in some other sector or region. Yes, this means negative emissions. These are possible, like in the case of afforestation. But other solutions exist. For example, electricity can be supplied by generating negative emissions at the same time. How? Burning biomass to produce electricity, which is carbon neutral, and then capturing the CO2 at the plant and storing it underground. For the most part, though, we will have to produce zero carbon electricity. This can be done using renewable sources. This clean electricity can then be used to substitute emitting fuels for many of the services we care for, as mobility or heating. We are not talking about technologies we don't know yet. Even more, the cost of some of these technologies, such as solar and batteries for cars, has gone down much more rapidly than we expected in recent times. This technological shift does come with some challenges. The power system needs to be reliable and stable, and renewable technologies represent a challenge to these requirements. Storage, demand-side management, improved grid infrastructure, hydrogen are all options that can meet such challenges but it is yet unknown which will prevail and solutions may be different in different countries. Technological and economic challenges are not all there is to this transformation. There are also potential ancillary benefits. When mobility is decarbonized, electrified and shared, quality of life improves. Similarly, when coal power plants shut down, local air quality improves, and this has immediate and large beneficial effects on ecosystems and on humans. But this is not a story about energy alone, as land use emissions are also crucial. This means changing agricultural practices, as well as seriously tackling deforestation around the globe. All these changes will require policies, up to now, although greenhouse gas emissions imply huge costs for society, 
present and future, nobody has paid the bill. Today, we have a good understanding of the risks associated with these emissions, and we have collectively decided we should not run those risks. This means we could associate a cost to those emissions so that they are reduced. In Europe, for example, we have developed a tool that serves that purpose, the European market for emissions. Some other countries are taxing CO2 emissions. But so far, the amount of emissions covered by such policies and the extent of these taxes are not enough. Putting a price on such a cost to society has two effects. Providing incentives to reduce emissions and generating revenues for those emissions that are not reduced. The latter should be used to minimize the costs imposed by the transition to the most vulnerable. But pricing carbon will not be enough. In the real world of conflicting political incentives, social perception and acceptance pressures, other policies, as for example technological standards, subsidies, innovation policies, might prove more easily implementable and successful. Developing economies are crucial to addressing our next phase of climate action. Because of their demographics, their natural resources that protect our environment, and because of the disproportionate impact the climate change will have on these countries. It is a pleasure to have here Barbara Buchner, Senior Director of the Climate Policy Initiative. Barbara, what are the top priorities for emerging economies? And how can advanced economies who contributed the most to greenhouse gas emissions in the 20th century best support those priorities? Well, governments need to make climate a priority. In many countries, we see resistance to this because of the fear that taking action on climate will jeopardize fragile economies. But we now have enough data to know that this is incorrect and that there are more short-term and long-term economic opportunities generated through sustainable approaches and transition to net zero economy than pursuing business as usual, which is increasingly costly, unpredictable, lacks resilience, and is harmful to the environment and human health. As part of these efforts, governments need to create good policies to lead the way. Fiscal policies like pricing carbon, reforming fossil fuel subsidies and procurement policies, developing green taxonomies and frameworks that better attract international investment, and green budget budgeting can be important elements in the government's climate toolkit. Why? Well, such approaches support countries in removing inefficiencies in public expenditures and in raising additional revenues which can be directed towards medium to long-term sustainable planning aligned with climate objectives. However, resource-constrained governments in developing countries and in emerging economies cannot do this alone. And this is where the international finance community has a crucial role to play. Development banks and other international financial institutions can help build strategy and support policy development. They can deploy a wide range of instruments that can to manage and share and reduce risk and they can convene relevant stakeholders and decision makers across the public and private sectors. And through these activities, they can greatly enhance what the private sector can do. The most challenging question now for you, how do we mobilize the investments required? Well, the money is available in the global financial system. It just needs to be channeled properly. All financial institutions across public and private sectors need to align their portfolios and their counterpart portfolios with a better future, including supporting sustainability efforts in emerging economies. As we saw with COVID-19, there are risks that transcend borders and then link biodiversity, climate, health and human well-being, and we ignore them at the peril of our investment returns. Mainstream is the need of the day, and there's an urgent need to shift the entire financial system to better respond to and help reduce and manage both physical and transition risks triggered by climate change. We also need to end fossil fuel investment and subsidies, which consume enormous amounts of public resources, by some estimates in excess of 5 trillion US dollars annually, and distort all aspects of the energy sector. 
All this requires building the right enabling environment that properly prices risks and returns of investments. Policies, again, lead the way, but at the same time, we need to push the boundaries and foster innovation to unlock investments, particularly for the sectors and geographies that are harder to tackle. You're seeing a lot of progress regarding innovative, catalytic and commercially sustainable financial products and instruments able to unlock private investment in clean energy and climate change. But we need more innovation in how finance for sustainable development is scaled and can create significant impact, particularly in emerging economies. Thank you, Barbara. The changing climate that we have already committed to with our past and current emissions will shape our future, as our collective response to the carbonized society will do. It is a complex effort requiring high level of coordination across sectors, activities and countries. It is possibly the largest challenge humanity has ever faced. It requires ingenuity and innovation, not just in technologies, but also in policy making and in our behaviors. It also requires never witnessed before levels of international cooperation. And it can only be done with social justice in mind.